Hello everyone and welcome to the Roka Report podcast in association with the Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen. And we're here today because Sunderland finally have new ownership. Carol Louis Dreyfus has bought out a majority stake in the club and uh, it's the news we've all been expecting for some time. But of course, we were waiting for the confirmation which has eventually came and we can actually talk about a bright future for Sunderland, hopefully. Today I'm joined by Connor Bromley, who's looking lovely. Nice shaved head today, Connor. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm actually. It's, it's not so much a shaved head now. It's just I'm, I'm past the point of receding whereby I just don't have hair <laughs> growing on the top. Save you a bit of money, won't it? Bit of time. I, money, I've not know? paid for a haircut for years, Gav. Honestly, nice. I can't remember the last time I paid for a haircut. The missus does it. And I'm also joined by uh, Rich Spate. How are you doing, Rich? I'm all right, yeah. Yeah. Yet to have my uh, New Year haircut, where my missus has been uh, shaving mine as well. Yeah, yeah it's a bit, of, a bit of a COVID cut situation going on. And nobody can see this, by the way. We're just talking amongst ourselves. <laughs> I've, yeah, I gave up on my hair at the first lockdown. I just shaved it a lot off, and it's kind of stuff. Kind of stuck with it. But yeah, we're here to talk about the takeover, not haircuts. And yeah, yeah. Uh, Sunderland have new ownership finally. Kira Louis Dreyfus, who's been in talks, well, for quite some time now. It's so. It, it. I was talking about this the other day with somebody. I don't feel like really excited to the point like where it's like breaking news. Sunderland have a new owner because we've actually had quite a long time to sort of process this and work out what we're going to be getting from from Dreyfus and as the Telegraph article which came out uh, earlier in the week about the takeover sort of confirmed Dreyfus has been pulling the strings for some time behind the scenes so all of the decisions we've seen made by the club um, in terms of Speakman's appointment uh, Lee Johnson's appointment the appointment of Steve Davison as the COO who's going to be working under under Dreyfus as one of the new members of the board um, all of these things have sort of been put in place in the build-up to this day, so it does feel more like a relief, if anything, doesn't it, Connor? Like that we've actually now got the news that things are, are kicking along nicely, and we can we can now start to look forward rather than backwards, and and start we're, we're out of that muddy period, aren't we? Where we're waiting for Dreyfus to be confirmed, so it's it's good news, I guess. Yeah, we've been a, a club in limbo probably since since the playoff final defeat really it, it feels like since that point we, we've never had a structure um certainly i noticed from being in there there was a massive difference between the 2018-19 season and the 2019-20 season there were the owners lost interest i would say charlie methvin was no longer around Stuart donald you never saw him around the academy it felt like from that point when plan a didn't work and we didn't get up that first season of jack ross there was no plan b and we were we were just stuck in this horrendous purgatory. It's probably the best way of describing it, where we've been desperately waiting for something to happen. We had obviously the Dell takeover potential last year, and to be honest, that looks like a blessing in disguise that we didn't get that in the end with all the stuff yeah. that's happened with mm-hmm. them. And hopefully, you know, this this takeover is the right one for us. It sounds like you know I read somewhere that he's he's trying to buy a property in the northeast. Suggests he's probably going to be yeah. around and active. That's a massive bonus. For me, I think that's a massive bonus for Sunderland fans because as an owner, we saw it with Ellis Shaw, it doesn't actually matter how much money you pump in. It doesn't matter about how amazing your academy, your stadium is. If you are not present and able to see what's happening with your money, then you've got a recipe for the disaster. So I think that's a huge plus. And that, to be honest, of everything I've seen, the thing that's excited me the most about this, and I know it sounds stupid, but it's the logistics of the fact that he's actually going to be around. I'm not saying he's going to live in the Northeast full time, but he's going to be here, aware of what's happening, probably have a feeling of what the city feels, the feeling of what yeah. the fans think. And I think that's absolutely mm-hmm. massive for Sunderland because we've actually not had something like that since Niall Quinn was, was chairman, yeah. really. It certainly feels like that. So I think this is a big news, big news for Sunderland. Actions speak louder than words. You know, that that's probably the main thing I take away from it. But so far, the stuff I've read, that this looks very, very positive for Sunderland. And the, th- the thing on that as well, Connor, with Louis Dreyfus possibly moving to the northeast is it might allay some fears quite legitimate fears that if he was you know still permanently in the south of france or geneva or wherever he lives at the minute that would open up just the prospect of you know donald and metfin controlling things or behind you know behind the scenes having more influence than their share might you know very small minority of shares would otherwise give them the fact that he's going to be there you know on a regular basis guiding things putting his vision into action through the the appointments that have been made and I'm sure there'll be more appointments to be made that gives me a lot of security that that minor that minority shareholdership won't be an issue in terms of the the way the clubs run like you've described how they you know stepped away you know lost interest 
that that influence won't be there anymore, or will at least will have Louis Dreyfus there to kind of as a bulwark against that. Yeah, it's interesting what you said there, Connor, about um, the and I know we don't want to dwell on this too much, but the Dell takeover that never happened. You, you're sort of seeing the business that they're doing around the world now, and it's, it does feel like a total bullet dodged. Where in this case with Dreyfus, he's he's a 23 year old with a lot of money and probably a lot of spunk in him. You know, he wants to do things and wants to you know get be hands on and get stuck into something. So mm-hmm. for for Sunderland, that enthusiasm is going to be very key because this is a massive, massive job. Like he cannot be under any illusions of how much of a huge task he's taken on and owning this cl- football club. And the important thing for me was that he had to surround himself with good people. And I think um, bringing in, and we don't know a great deal about Steve Davison, but he's a Sunderland fan. Mm. His CV is very impressive in terms of the job he's coming to do at Sunderland. So that's one big tick for me. I think, you know, if you can get as many Sunderland fans working around the club day to day as possible, that's huge because it's served us well in the past having Sunderland people involved. And obviously Speakman has had a, a bit of time to get his feet under the table and He's sort of seen the lay of the land. He he knows the club well enough, probably at this stage, to be able to put his finger on what needs to change in the short and medium term. And that's key for for Dreyfus. And I'm sure they've been in constant contact since he took the job because, like I said a little bit earlier, he probably made that appointment. So we know that. And I think the article in the Telegraph called Speakman the the jewel in the crown, you know, the founding stone in this entire project because Dreyfus needs to be able to look upon the people working beneath them and trust them first and foremost. And one thing we've heard a lot about throughout this process with Dreyfus is the want to become academy centric. We all know we've got this category one academy, but we all know we've, it's never been properly utilized really. I mean, people point to Jordan Pickford and Jordan Henderson, but those are two players in like nearly 20 years of an academy mm. It's not great, really, when you consider the amount of money probably invested in it. So going forward, we need to become academy-centric, and it's nice that they've identified that. I think the key thing is is that Dreyfus has clearly identified what went wrong in the past. What you said, Connor, about moving to the northeast is massive because Short never did it, Donald Methan never did it, and it's very easy to become detached from what's actually going on when you're not there. So for me, all of what I'm hearing sounds fantastic, but what you said is right, Connor. Actions speak louder than words, don't they? Mm-hmm. No, definitely. Yeah. The main thing that needs to happen at Sunderland is it's all infrastructural, really. That that that's the main crux of what's went wrong at Sunderland for the last ten years is the wrong people off the pitch. You know, we Gary Hutchinson, somebody you know that we've heard a lot about, and you know, he was basically one of the kingpins running the club for years, and. There's many, you know, if you, you, there's many stories about him that makes you wonder, well, how did this person have influence and power? And the important thing is now is that off the pitch, we sort out all them issues because there's people who work for the football club who maybe have been there a little bit too long or maybe stuck in their ways, have maybe clung on to positions that maybe they don't deserve. Totally, yeah. And mm-hmm. it's vital that, you know, Dreyfus comes in and, and actually sorts out them issues because you, you can't have people clinging on. Because, you know, they've been there, you know, you've got people who've been there for 15 years who are directors and you're like, well, you've clearly not done a very good job because we're in League One right now. You know, we're we're struggling in League One and you're still sitting there. So clearly there's something wrong there. And I'm not talking about the the day-to-day staff who do very, very good jobs. It's the people who are a little bit above that. The management structure of the club, to me, is is not right. And to, to succeed on the pitch, you have to be succeeding off the pitch. And I don't think Sunderland succeeded off the pitch for donkey's years i don't know if we've succeeded off the pitch to be honest since bob murray left you know it it's been that bad for that long so i just want to see then things happen and if the off the pitch is doing well you'd think the on the pitch will improve as a result and this is a, a chance i think dreyfus is lucky in the sense that we're at well lowest ebb he's lucky in the sense that he's actually coming in after a transfer window so there's no pressure on spending millions and bringing in players straight away they've got a chance to assess the squad new managers came in new uh, Christian Speakmans came in, they can assess everything that's going on at the football club and they have loads of time to work out A, the simple things of which players to keep when they go out of contract, but B, work out which academy staff they like, which academy staff are worth keeping, what they need to improve in the academy staff, what they need to improve on scouts, recruitment. It's a clean slate and if I was somebody coming into a business wanting to put my stamp on it, this is the perfect business to do it because we are literally a skeleton yeah. staff or a skeleton 
infrastructure, you've got a chance to make real changes, you know, and actually do it quite rapidly and quite quickly because it's not a case of getting rid of 100 staff and bringing 100 in. We're talking about getting rid of maybe 5 to 10 staff and then, you know, adding in your new influx of fresh blood that have got new ideas and changing mm. from that old guard that's are still lingering at the football club and bring in, you know, something fresh and new. Yeah. What's your feeling on the way the deal's structured then, Rich? We've heard quite a lot about how it's been put together, you know, with the comparisons being made with the, we sort of mentioned the Dell mm. takeover that never happened. And we're seeing other sort of similar situations at other clubs like Burnley, who've, uh, they were actually bought in a similar way to how Donald and Methvin done it. Where with this, with this deal, we were led to believe, you know, it's all fairly kosher. You know, he's bought it outright. Yeah. There's no debt being attached to the club. Nothing's being leveraged against the, the club's assets like the stadium and the academy. So that's good, isn't it, really? <laughs> that's all really positive. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, people wanted a completely clean break. That clearly wasn't on offer from Donald. You know, he, he got to choose how many of his, his shares he's, he's sold and what percentage. And yeah. uh, as we understand, I think Louis Drave has made a concerted effort to ensure that he had complete control in his own right, which I think is important. Although, obviously, he's got business and kind of family connections with Juan Satori. Obviously, they, they, they share commodities, business interests. They share family football interests on the south coast of France. Yeah. So they're obviously allies. But the fact that he owns nearly 60% of the club in his own right, I think should give us assurance, like I said before, that it'll be he who's making the decisions. I think all of these things, including the plans, including the focus on youth development, they need to be set out really, really clearly to fans. Now, I know Speakman's done two rounds of uh, the Unfiltered podcast, which is really good. Love the way he speaks on that. And, you know, in terms of selling a vision to fans, I think that's probably the one of the best ways to go about it. But also, we've got the new um, Sports Trust, the Red and White Army convert into a Sports Trust. I think it's going to be really important that those structured dialogue meetings that the club has to embark upon, you know, three, four times a year, um, if it's going to live up to, you know, the, the Sports Charter, then uh, that they go ahead and that they're, they're done in a constructive way and a clear and transparent way where there's no attempts to kind of hoodwink and hide things. There shouldn't be, with this deal, anything to hide in terms of how it's been financed. We're not worried about it being, I say, leveraged against loans or leveraged against parachute payments. So hopefully all of those kinds of really complicated and very difficult to understand for ordinary fans issues around how the club was bought won't be there and we can move on in terms of the conversations with uh, between the club and fans about improving the stadium experience about investing in in the youth you know if you look at the red and white army survey from last year the main concern that fans had with donald was actually the the lack of investment in youth and the real worry was the the loss of you know some key talent to other academies and the impact that would have on the club in the long term. So, um, yeah, I do think it's it's great that there's a chance for a reset um, and that kind of some of these legacy issues can, can be put behind us. Nobody's overly happy that Donald and Metfin will have the chance to make money off off this uh, as we move through the leagues, but that's the way it is, you know, like, like yeah. I keep saying, you can't sell require someone to sell their property, which is... Yeah. Which is which is what many people were asking or basically demanding that 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 Donald did in terms of selling up entirely. I think the one thing that I'm really looking forward to from this takeover is as a fan base, we've become obsessed with finances, mm-hmm. obsessed with money, boardroom directors, you know, trying to catch people out. They're telling lies. They're telling this. They're telling that. And you know, a lot of that. It's come from the, well, it has come 100% from that. And the, the podcast that Stuart and Donald did has fueled that. And the way they were open, but basically telling lies the whole time, we've become mm-hmm. paranoid as a fan base. It would be lovely if when COVID's over and you do go to the pub with your mates and you can talk about football, that the conversation wasn't about ownership and not about football. Because for so long, probably since you know Allardyce left, really, it's felt like we've been talking about ownership and the thing hanging over Sunderland Football Club for years has been ownership, directors, yeah. money spending, That's a great point, what's yeah. happening off yeah. the pitch. And as a fan base, we, we need to we we need to focus on football because it it's the two things, you know. It being a Sunderland fan is fifty percent what's happening in the match, 
But then that's always tied with, well, what's happening off the pitch? Well, you know, he's not playing the young players. We're losing academy players and all that sort of stuff, which is very valid stuff to complain about. Don't get us wrong. But as a fan, I just want to go back to being a fan of the football team and not having to worry about, you know, where the ownership's paying for stuff, whether the stadium's being le- uh, leveraged on loan. I'm desperate for us to go back to being a, a football club and a, a fan base that's wanting to focus on football and, you know, not having to do... I mean, how many podcasts have we done over the last year talking about ownership? It's just a non-stop mm-hmm. thing that goes on and on. And to be honest, being a football fan, the owners should be irrelevant. They should be the one thing you're not really that bothered about. Oh, yeah, he's the owner. Yeah, he, he ticks along. He's, he does the odd interview. That's that's what you want, really. I'm desperate yeah, for us to go back yeah. to that. And I think that's something that is a fan base we, we need because we're... You know, we're, we're depressed as a fan base. Everything you see on social media, everything you see, you know, even at games, the football club is is a completely in a dis- depressed state. The stadium's hmm. rickety and old. It's not the beacon of hope that it was for years of, oh my God, where's Sunderland? We've got the stadium. Like, it's amazing. It's not now. It's a tired facility. There's so much we've lost to be proud of. And I just hope that this takeover can give us that feeling of, yeah, we're Sunderland fans and we're proud of the club. Because I don't think hand on heart right now, any of us are particularly proud of being Sunderland fans. No, I would like to think this is going to catapult us back into the thinking of like, well, Sunderland are, Sunderland are still a big club of potential. He has an owner who's coming in and he's going to he's gonna be modern in his approach to everything, which we've not been for, well, I can never, ever remember as a Sunderland fan, thinking that we were modern in our approach to anything, really, other than maybe when the stadium light like, opened and we got a nice new academy, you know, there's Sunderland, and at that stage, we're, we're yeah, modernising, but it just feels like we've we've, ticked, we've we've sort of just kicked the can along for so long now and um, got by, and wouldn't it be nice to just be able to say, like, we're, we're at the forefront when it comes to data and analytics, we're at the forefront when it comes to recruitment, we're at the forefront when it comes to our facilities, we're at the forefront when it comes to how we communicate with supporters. We're at the forefront in terms of our digital output and, you know, streaming service. Like, wouldn't it be nice to just be the best at something for once? And that's what they can do with this investment. It doesn't have to just be in, in you know, in terms of which player we're going to sign in January or the summer. It, it's the whole package, isn't it? And that that's what's yeah. been missing for so long now, I think. Yeah, I think you've said recently and written recently about how your, Lee Johnson's management speaks getting on your on your tits a bit yeah yeah just and, a bit. and all that and <laughs> and you know and we've had our we've had a conversation about this but and and words are cheap you know and words are not results on the pitch but what i've been impressed in terms of johnson and speakman um and those are key you know louis drift's key appointments really on the football inside is that there is that kind of new modern approach although it might get on your nerves a bit in terms of the the use of language to me it indicates a new kind of seriousness, a new progressiveness in terms of mm. how we talk about football at Sunderland Football Club. It's not just get it up, you know, get it up the pitch, get rid kind of old school tactics, which which are a result of old school thinking all the way through the club from to, from top to bottom. It is about that setting that culture of excellence and the expectation of high standards and of professionalism and and yeah, so. That really, I think, is going to be important, and I think it's it's just good that now we can just get on and, like Connor was saying, just think about the football, think about the yeah. tactics, think about the the players on the pitch who should be playing in what position. It's been nice over the last couple of months as this d- deal has obviously been going through. To th- there has been a refocusing on the on field activities, and I just hope we can keep not having to do these podcasts about business and kind of yeah and structures and and all that uh, and, and and like you say we can just get on yeah well this podcast was only meant to be a quick reaction to the news so we'll we'll not go much further um i'm sure we'll get into the the meat and bones of it as the as the months and hopefully years progress under this owner but um everything does feel pretty exciting when in terms of what they propose and like i said at the start um this is just kind of a, a confirmation of that this is happening. We've had a lot. We've we've had quite a while now to sort of come to terms with with the change that's going on. But it's just been nice to to finally be able to say that Kirill Louis Dreyfus is part of Sunderland Football Club. But first and foremost, that's what what's occurring. He has become part of our club, and we wish him all the best. And his success is our success, isn't it? So he's coming to Sunderland with big ideas and 
bold ambitions and we just want to uh, cheer them on and go along with the ride because as previous owners have shown if you if you take us for granted the fans will not forget it in a hurry because um, we just want to be treat properly we don't want them to take the piss out of our football club basically and it's felt too often in the past that people either don't get it or they've took the piss a bit and um, this is now the chance for somebody to draw a line under all of that crap start again bring standards up to the to where they should be at a football club this size and build something special. And that, that's the top and bottom of it, really. Sunderland's a special football club that's just sort of been allowed to drop into a level in a situation that it really should never have got to. And um, we don't want to be talking about that anymore, like Connor said. We want to just be talking about how, how good everything's going to be in the future. So for me, he gets my best wishes, and I'm sure he does you too as well. Viva la Sunderland. Maybe Sean will lead with that. A little bit of French music. Viva <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, cheers, lads, for joining us. Like I say, we'll be uh, sure to be on top of everything as it progresses. But like Connor says, wouldn't it be nice to just do a podcast without talking about owners? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> cheers, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. And we'll uh, right. catch you down the road. Yeah, au revoir. Yeah, bye.